Pan Pan Psychast. Part two: further analysis and discussion. So, David, at the start of our introductory questions in last week's instalment. I think you mentioned that people thought in The Conscious Mind, your book of 1996, you were arguing for a form of epiphenomenalism. And this is the view that consciousness doesn't have any causal powers. It's kind of like the puff of smoke of a train. It's just the the side effect of it. Um, are people wrong to think that was your view now? Because in, in from the book, it seems had a similar reading that you were a type of naturalistic dualist. Would you say that this is the most plausible view? Yeah, in the in, in the conscious mind, which came out in 1996, I was what I called a naturalistic dualist, which was saying consciousness is distinct from any physical process, but we can still subsume mm. it under scientific law by positing laws that connect physical processes and consciousness. And the kind of laws that I talked, I focused on the most were laws from physical processes to consciousness. And I suggested, uh, it looks like the physical world is itself causally closed, so not much room for separate impact of consciousness on the physical world. And that gives you a couple of options. Option one is epiphenomenalism. Consciousness is not playing any causal role. And option two is panpsychism, the view that consciousness is somehow present at the very bottom level of the physical universe. And those were roughly the two views that I took seriously in the conscious mind but maybe for much of it there was a bit more focus on epiphenomenalism i wasn't committed to it these days i would say i take a third option more seriously than i did then which is interactionist dualism the idea that consciousness is separate from any physical process um, but has some effects on physical processes this was famously descartes view Mm. and it encounters the famous interaction problem how Does something Mm non-physical manage to affect anything physical? And there are, you know, Descartes thought it happened through the pineal gland. Um, But these days people think it's hard to see how that's consistent with physics because physics looks like it's closed. So in the book, I argued against this view. These days I take it more seriously. I think there are some serious options for non-physical consciousness to affect the physical world. And one of those is through quantum mechanics where there's this very old idea around the place Mm. that consciousness might play a role in collapsing the quantum wave function on certain occasions of measurement. It looks like quantum mechanics says when measurements happen, something special happens physically. What's a measurement? Well, no one knows, but one very traditional idea is that a measurement might be an act of consciousness. So at the very least, this gives you a possibility Mm -hmm. for a causal role of consciousness that's consistent with physics, arguably even suggested by physics. For a long time, I didn't take this too seriously. No one had ever really been managed to develop the view very seriously. But lately, the last few years, I've been working with a co-author, my old student, Calvin McQueen, who's now a professor of philosophy and physics mm. at Chapman University in California, on making this idea work. And we've got quite heavy into the mathematics and the physics to see if we can come up with a version of this idea that consciousness plays a causal role in quantum collapse, see if we can make that work. And our results have been mixed. We had a first very simple version of this that turned out out not to work. It had the rather unfortunate consequence that uh, states of consciousness would never be able to change, so nobody would ever wake up from a nap. (laughs) That thesis was empirically uh, refuted the first day anybody woke up from a nap. Um, but uh, you know, so we moved on to more uh, to more complicated versions, and we think we have something that's at least got a chance of working, albeit not quite as simple as the original idea. And hopefully soon we're going to be uh, we're going to be publishing that. But if that idea can be made to work, that would be a version of interactionism. So basically, I divide my views about positive theories of consciousness and its place in nature between interactionism, epiphenomenalism, and panpsychism and associated views you're notoriously difficult to to pin down on one of them and as you say there you you know you you're spreading your credences 
um, between I'm certain extremely views easy to pin down. Things. It's just that you know, I, I only I, I go where the arguments <laughs> take me and uh, and not beyond. So so if materialism is false, I'll tell you materialism is false. But if I tell you these arguments um, don't establish that one that epiphenomenalism is correct or interactionism is correct, I'll tell you. One of them is correct, but um, I hope I'm at least being clear and explicit about these matters. No, you, maybe I phrased it uh, wrongly. You're not f- <laughs> you're not fully committed to one view and, and not prepared to move or take others into uh, consideration. I just a couple of quotes from you here. One from December 2019. You say, uh, "I'm going to give my overall credences: 10% to illusionism, 30% to panpsychism, 30% to dualism, and the other 30% to uh, whatever else could be true." You're keeping these as live options, as uh, tenable hypotheses. But one quote from you here, you seem to be against the reductionist account entirely. So quote from you here in, in early 2000, no explanation solely in terms of brain processes will be such that we can deduce the existence of consciousness from it. I think that someone could know all the physical facts about the world and still not know about consciousness. Do you, you reject the idea of, of a reductionist account coming from physicalism? Yeah, that's fairly close to the core of my view, which is I reject standard forms of physicalism or materialism, just on the grounds that those mm. can't explain consciousness. Maybe certain radical forms of materialism could be correct. Some people see panpsychism as a radical form of materialism. We explain everything in terms of matter. It's just that matter somehow includes a bit of mind at the bottom level. I'm at least open to that. Mm-hmm. Another radical form of materialism is illusionism. The idea that consciousness is just an illusion, but we can at least explain the illusion in physical form. I'm inclined to think that's wrong and crazy, but nonetheless, I find it a very interesting idea. And who's to say that I'm not in the grip of some strange illusions here? So that's why I gave that 10% to that radical form. But the kind of the boring form of materialism, it says, okay, well, yeah. Here's the neural correlates of consciousness, and and here's a conscious experience, and they're just identical, Mm -hmm. and so on. I'm inclined to think those don't work. For materialism to work, it's got to be fairly fairly radical. Although, that said, I have to admit, at the end of the day, I'm a philosopher. Most philosophers are wrong about many things, including their central topics. So maybe I'm wrong about uh, about all of this. So the last last 30%, or maybe there's just stuff I haven't imagined yet. So that last Mm. 30%, that you quoted, and that's just for the possibility mm-hmm. that somehow I'm wrong about all of this, or there are going to be amazing new possibilities I haven't thought about. I think you know every philosopher has to have a little bit of like higher order humility about this and say, oh, I could be wrong. But that's it. Most of the time, we're just engaged in our first order reasoning, and you know it seems to me that's roughly those are roughly the options that that get laid out when I go through that first order reasoning. Frank Jackson, who we spoke about earlier, has suggested that the knowledge argument doesn't actually show us that we need to induce new properties that Mary learns once she leaves her black and white prison. Instead, he now says that what we learn about our relations between surface reflectance profiles, that's what he calls them. And he says, in fact, that when Mary would was in her room, she would have that knowledge in the first place. And then when she leaves the room, she is simply able to recognize a new state that she's in, which would give her the same knowledge as before. What do you think of um, this proposal of Jackson's here, David? I'm very fond of Frank Jackson and his uh, his argument. Um, we worked together at the ANU for many years. Sometimes, so yeah, back in the 1980s, he put forward this knowledge argument against materialism based on the case of Mary in the black and white room. Which was kind of interesting because in the years after that, he developed this very strong physicalist research program where he was a functionalist like David Lewis, had something called the Canberra Plan Mm -hmm. for reducing everything to the physical, except, well, except for consciousness. And I think this certainly, so my my psychoanalytic explanation of this is that this induced a kind of cognitive dissonance in Frank. Um, He had this amazing reductionist research program the Canberra plan for reducing everything and supported almost across the board a kind of physicalism. And then he'd find himself saying things like, well, the dualist would say, and then it's like, oh, damn, I'm a dualist. <laughs> so, uh, so, so my view was that deep, so I think he basically became convinced that physicalism had to be true. But also, mm-hmm. but I think at least, at least initially, it wasn't that he knew there was something he could tell you what was wrong with the knowledge argument. It's just he became convinced the conclusion had to be false. So, Sometime in something he wrote in the late 90s, he talked about 
the following reply to a knowledge argument. He called it the there must be a reply reply. <laughs> um, it basically goes like this. I don't can't find anything wrong with the knowledge argument. It seems to work to me, but there must be something wrong with it because the conclusion is false. You know, epiphenomenalism can't be true. Physicalism mm -hmm. has to be true. There has to be something wrong with the knowledge argument, so there must be a reply. And I think that was a fairly accurate representation of his psychological state around that point. And then he became looking around for an actual reply and saying, uh, you know, how does it actually go? And I guess what you said is his about his reply was his reply at a certain point. But I've never actually found any of those specific replies nearly as convincing or as telling as his there must be a reply reply. <laughs> He wrote an article called Mind and Illusion that at least put mm -hmm. forward one central part of the reply was that we have various illusions when it comes to uh, to consciousness and color. We perceive properties that aren't there. I guess I'm inclined to think that that is the most promising line to take. If you want to be a, sta a physicalist, not a panpsychist, but a standard physicalist, you have to think that some of our intuitions about consciousness are based on illusion. And I think basically Frank's view is the view that there's a very strong intuition that Mary gains new knowledge when she leaves the black and white room. She learns what mm -hmm. it's like to see a color red, learns new facts about that. And the physicalist at some level has to say, that's an illusion, right? So insofar as Frank is pushing the line that, you know, it's just an illusion that Mary gains new knowledge, I think, well, that's probably the best place to push. But, you know, I still find it ultimately a view that's very difficult to believe. So our previous guest, uh, Sue Blackmore, uh, in a special illusionist edition in the Journal of Consciousness Studies, writes, quote, The illusionist research program is clearly worth pursuing. Indeed, it may be the only research program worth pursuing. Um, could you tell us what the uh, tell us what illusion, illusionism is, David, fully? Uh, and to follow up, why do you think philosophers are becoming more attracted to the illusionist research program? So illusionism is basically the view that consciousness is an illusion, or at least that the problem of consciousness is based on an illusion. It comes in two forms. The strongest form is strong illusionism. Basically says no one is conscious. No one has subjective experience at all. We just think we do. We're in the grip of you know brain mechanisms that make us believe we have these special properties of consciousness that nobody really has. In its strongest form, it'll say nobody ever really genuinely felt a pain or experienced red. Those are just, at least the subjective experience part is just an illusion. Weak illusionism says, okay, maybe people are conscious, maybe they feel pain and they experience red, but these things don't have all the properties that they intuitively seem to have. So maybe these things seem to be irreducible or primitive or ineffable or some such. And in fact, they don't have those properties. So weak illusionism says that, yeah, maybe we are conscious, but we are very deeply wrong about its nature. So either way, you have introspective illusions. And the connection to the hard problem, problem is that it's meant to be these introspective illusions about consciousness that lead us to believe that there is a hard problem of consciousness. So, you know, Keith Frankish, who's been one of the leaders on illusionism in recent years, says, well, I agree. There really is a, if there is consciousness, and there really is a, it's pretty much impossible to accommodate it materialistically. There could be no physical explanation of consciousness, at least as we normally conceive of it. But instead of saying, ah, expand our picture of the physical world, he says, oh, get rid of consciousness. Consciousness is an illusion. The problem for illusionism is it basically seems kind of unbelievable because consciousness seems to be a datum. So that's the, the enormous problem of any, any version of strong illusionism has to get past, it seems that they're just denying something completely obvious. But if it can be done, it offers a particularly elegant resolution. I've actually gotten very interested in illusionism through an associated issue I call the meta problem of mm -hmm. consciousness. Remember, the hard problem is explaining how it is that physical processes give you subjective experience. The meta problem is the problem of explaining why it seems to us that there is a hard problem of consciousness and why it seems to us that it's hard to explain consciousness in physical terms. And one mm -hmm. thing that's interesting here is that, you know, we distinguish the hard problem, explaining experience, from the easy problems, explaining behaviors. It's arguable there's at least an aspect of the meta problem, which is an easy problem. We go around saying things like, 
consciousness is very hard to explain. I've already said a million times, um, you know, there is a hard problem of consciousness. There's a gap there. Well, then you say, why do I say those kinds of things? Those are behaviors. Science ought to be able to explain why we say those things. And yeah, maybe I should be open to there being an explanation of that in neurobiological terms. So that's the meta problem. Here's, here's the best argument for illusionism I know. We will eventually be able to explain all the things we say about consciousness in physical terms, including our judgment that we're conscious, that consciousness is irreducible, and so on. If we can explain all those things in physical terms, then we no longer have any reason to believe that there genuinely is inexplicable consciousness. Um, therefore, you should be an illusionist. And that I find a fascinating argument, and that's why I've got some sympathy mm. for illusionism. I recently wrote a long article on this meta problem and dealing with all these articles, all these issues. Ultimately, I don't think illusionism works for the that basic central reason that it seems to contradict a datum, but it's a fascinating view, and you know, mm -hmm. the dialectic is interesting. I say illusionism is unbelievable. You're contradicting contradicting data, and I say yes, I can explain exactly why you say that. There's an <laughs> there's an evolutionary mechanism inside your head that makes you certain that you have this special property of consciousness and makes mm. the truth of illusionism precisely unbelievable to you. So I can explain why you believe that this is unbelievable. That's kind of a cool view. We'll jump onto the meta problem in a moment. Um, you mentioned earlier, and you said just again there, you know, you've got some some interest in illusionism, and you at least think it's uh, something worth pursuing. We had a previous guest, Galen Strawson, and you'll know uh, what he thinks of this, and I'll give it for the listeners here. He calls illusionism the denial. And um, here's a quote from him from our interview. Illusionism is the silliest view about reality that has ever been held by any human being. And a separate quote from him here. The illusionists sail off the edge of the world in the great ship of fools, crewed by flat earthers under the command of Rear Admiral Daniel Dennett, and we must let them go. This doesn't seem like the type of ship we want to be on at all. I imagine you disagree with Strawson that it's the silliest view ever held by a human being. Oh, you know, Galen's very uh, has, has very strong views about this matter and is set in his ways. By now, I guess my view is the problem of consciousness is hard enough that we should be open to all kinds of radical, crazy-sounding views. To many people, panpsychism, which Galen favors, is a radical, crazy-sounding view and one of the silliest things ever, <laughs> ever believed. I guess you know, I certainly see the problems with uh, illusionism, but that said, I think you know. We need radical ideas. And I think there's a certain subtle elegance to illusionism that Galen has missed. And I mean, there's simple denials. Oh, there's no such thing as consciousness. It's nonsense. And that view, that view I find kind of ridiculous. But I think when illusionism is, is properly developed, it's far more subtle and sophisticated than that. It recognizes the force of these intuitions we have about consciousness. It recognizes they're very strong and hard to resist, and then somehow tries to undermine them and explain them away by giving an explanation of the intuitions themselves. And I think it's a very subtle and interesting move, at the very least. Ultimately, maybe it doesn't work. Maybe it still contradicts the data. But I do think of it as, um, to me, it's one of the few materialist views that actually does take consciousness seriously, because mm -hmm. it takes these intuitions so seriously. So I'd much prefer it to you know, various flat-footed forms of materialism that simply deny consciousness out of hand or simply mm -hmm. assert a reductionist thesis. So you mentioned there a moment ago, David, the meta-problem of consciousness, the problem of saying why we think there is a problem of consciousness. But in addition to that, you say, well, look, we have this challenge. Um, and you've kind of written about this in the past, I think, with in papers Consciousness and Cognition and in Conscious Mind, Paradox of Phenomenal Judgment. But could you explain to our listeners what the challenge of the meta problem is and why a theory of consciousness needs to at least help explain the meta problem? Yeah, so the meta problem is the problem of roughly explaining why we say the things we do about consciousness, including everything from reports like, I am conscious, I'm experiencing red, to things like, well, consciousness is very hard to explain. Mary in the black and white room wouldn't know what it's like to see red. These are all things that we say. They're intuitions we assert about consciousness. The meta problem is the problem of ex explaining those. And you know, whether you're an illusionist or not, mm -hmm. the meta problem is an interesting and important problem. You know, it is a fact that we say these things. 
there ought to be some explanation in some terms. Mm. So what I call the meta problem challenge, I mean, one way to take it is towards illusionism. Explain those judgments. That's all we have to explain. No such thing as consciousness. But even if you're a realist about consciousness, you think it's real, then I think the meta problem is very relevant. And one way it comes in is through this meta problem challenge. And here the idea is you've got a scientific theory of consciousness. It says such and such is the neural basis or the mechanism of consciousness. The meta problem challenge says basically for a good theory of consciousness, whatever you say is the neural basis of consciousness, that had also better play a pretty central role in explaining the things we say about consciousness. It would just be very surprising if the neural basis of consciousness was independent of all the stuff we say. Mm. So if you've got a theory like, say, Tononi's integrated information theory, where consciousness is having enough integrated information, you need to be able to tell some kind of story about why that integrated information would tend to make you say things like, I am conscious, I'm experiencing such and such, and maybe even to have things like the hard problem intuitions. Right now, I haven't seen anybody on the integrated information theory side doing something like that. So that's why it's a challenge to these theories. Mm -hmm. Show how what your theory says is the neural basis of consciousness. Show how that could play a role in explaining the things we say. So the next question, David, is going to be about evolution. So uh, Blackmore uses two hypothetical creatures to highlight the problem of thinking about consciousness and its place in evolution. So she says, consider two hypothetical creatures, conchies and zombies. Zombies are completely identical to us in every way, but they have no inner world, no qualia. On the other hand, conchies are just the same, but they do undergo experiences. Blackmore thinks that evolution has no reason to favour conchies over zombies. Can we tell an evolutionary story about the origin of consciousness? Yeah, so the zombie thought experiment can be used for many different purposes in philosophy. So these are zombies who are like us physically, behaviorally, functionally. Um, they do all the things we do, but we're not conscious at all. One version of them is just behaviorally the same. Another version of them says maybe they're made of silicon, but they duplicate our brain processes in silicon, but they're not conscious. And the extreme version says they're physically identical without consciousness. In my own um, book, The Conscious Mind, I argued we can at least conceive of zombies. There's no contradiction in the idea and use that to raise a version of the hard problem. But here, Sue Blackmore is using it for a somewhat different purpose. And I think basically the reasoning is something like this. A conscious creature and a zombie would do just the same thing, so evolution can't distinguish between them. Zombies would leave as many offspring as conscious beings, so evolution alone can't explain why we're conscious and not zombies. I think that's actually not a bad argument. Evolution alone can't explain it. But um, I think it just there are still roots left for anyone who wants to think there is a role and a function for consciousness. You just need to bring in something more than evolution. So just say, for example, consciousness collapses wave functions mm -hmm. and thereby leads to sophisticated kinds of behavior that you couldn't get without consciousness. Then there's a there's a pretty straightforward story about how evolution could uh, could select for consciousness because there'd be certain kinds of intelligent behavior which at least in our universe um, you can only get if you're conscious and not if you're not conscious. So in our universe the claim would be if you had a zombie without consciousness it couldn't collapse all these wave functions it wouldn't produce the same kind of intelligent. Hmm behavior. I mean, maybe it's still conceivable you could have a zombie that did all that, but not in our world. So that's to say that it could, if you can tell some story about how consciousness has a special causal role, then we can leverage evolution to help explain why it is that we have, why we have consciousness. But you still, but evolution won't do all the work for you. You still need some kind of underlying story about how it is that consciousness can play a causal role in the physical universe. So in the conscious mind, David, you say that the zombie would be as effective as passing on its copies of its genes as we would then. But now you're saying, well, your thinking has changed slightly, maybe because you're more prone to think uh, a form of interactionist dualism is preferable and that we would have uh, consciousness would help select physical process that are better for survival or conducive to survival. Is that the idea now? 
That's part of it. Um, I'm certainly more open to interactionist views where non-physical consciousness mm. plays a causal role than I was then. But I think when I talked about evolution back in the conscious mind, I was just making a limited point, which is that evolution alone can't explain this. Because evolution alone can't explain why we're conscious. We're not zombies. Uh, there might be something else that explains mm. why we're not uh, why we're not zombies or why a zombie in our world couldn't do all the uh, all those amazing things. And if consciousness plays a causal role, that could help to explain it. But even there, when I'm bringing in, say, quantum mechanics, I'm going way beyond evolution mm. in making that point. So I think I was just trying to answer someone that said that you know evolution was going to solve the hard problem for us. Mm. Yes, because I remember in the conscious mind you say, well, look, if consciousness is going to be fundamental, in effect, it can't be a product of evolution precisely because it is fundamental and it's primitive. And that introduces this kind of dissociation between the quality and the function. They kind of seem arbitrary. But you now, is the idea you think because of interactionist um, sorts of dualism, the quality and function of consciousness may not be arbitrary in the way that the epiphenomenalists would have to say they were? Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I think if certainly if you're interactionist, you'll think there are laws saying how consciousness affects physical processes. So certain mm. qualities of consciousness will play have certain functional roles. It's then a really interesting question whether that is still somewhat arbitrary. You know, maybe there's one world, in our world, pain plays the, the role of leading to aversive behavior where you try and run away from the stimulus. Could there be a world where pain played the role of pleasure? And when people have pain, they seek out more of it. Mm. It's a really interesting question, which I don't have a settled view on. But uh, in recent yeah, in recent years, Hedda Merck, who you've had on the uh, the podcast, okay. has developed a very interesting phenomenal powers view where this mat this matchup is not is not arbitrary. Maybe something about the nature of pain makes it be tied to a certain causal role. So pain could not really have played the kind of causal role that pleasure does, and so on. And I'm not unsympathetic with this view. I certainly have the uh, intuitions that something about pain seems distinctively tied to the that role, the aversive role, and not the let's get more of it role. It certainly seems that a being that tried to get more and more pain would be in a certain sense irrational, you know, at least for its own sake, setting aside complications like masochism and the like. Um, there's certainly be something irrational about that. Does that make it impossible or inconceivable? I'm not sure, but I I at least find this uh, this view that maybe phenomenology comes with certain intrinsic causal powers appealing and attractive. I mean, in some ways, it sounds like the old functionalist idea that consciousness just is a causal power. That's all there is to it. That's a very deflationary view. We just explain the causal role and you've explained consciousness. That's like saying there's no hard problem. So that view I reject. But uh, but this version of it that says, yes, there is consciousness, it's real, it's irreducible, and it, every state of consciousness plays its own distinctive causal role by its nature, I at least find appealing and attractive. So you mentioned there. Uh... Uh, IIT and our discussion with Hedda Hassel Merck. Um, and one of the things we talked about with Hedda is um, how IIT could maybe give us some things that look like what you talked about in the conscious mind as being those fundamental psychophysical laws. Do you think that IIT is a plausible theory that fits well with those speculations of yours from the mid 90s? For instance, does it fit with um, organizational invariance and the principle of structural coherence and um, things like this? Yeah, I find integrated information theory fascinating. Back in back in the conscious mind, in uh, one of the later chapters, I had a whole chapter devoted to the idea that consciousness might be linked to information, mm. uh, that somehow there might be two aspects of information and the best way to formulate psychophysical laws might be in terms of information. But I didn't have a formal mathematical framework for doing it. So mm. Giulio, what Giulio Tononi has done since then has come up with a very detailed formal mathematical framework for seeing how laws connecting physical processes and consciousness might be formulatable in terms of information. So in spirit, at least, it's very much consistent with what I was thinking then. Um, you know, there's a few places, though, where it comes apart. One is that uh, it turns out that integrated information theorists are not so sympathetic to the idea that, say, a computer simulation of a conscious being will be conscious. I'm very sympathetic to that idea. But for the for many IIT theorists, something about the parallelism 
is very central mm. to uh, to consciousness, and you need a any system that runs through a CPU won't be conscious. So Christoph Koch recently wrote a book all about IIT saying mm. why consciousness is ubiquitous but can't be computed. Mm -hmm. I'm more sympathetic with the computational angle. Also, you know, IIT is not fully panpsychist. Mm -hmm. I think um, he says a single unit is not conscious. Once you get to two units interacting in the right way, then they have a, get to have a certain kind of integrated information. Mm -hmm. And therefore... They, that has a little bit of consciousness. But now, no consciousness at the truly fundamental level of the physical world. And that makes it harder to combine this with the standard panpsychist idea that, you know, mind is part of fundamental reality. This is an idea that goes back to Bertrand Russell, that somehow there might be some intrinsic qualities underlying physics. Because mm -hmm. variety doesn't quite come in at the physics level, like atoms. It comes in at groups of atoms. And so that leaves us with problems like how is consciousness really playing a genuine causal role in the physical world if you think that atoms, for example, are what's doing that fundamentally. I mean, IIT theorists have something to say about this, but it's just not, there's a respect in which it may not be quite panpsychist enough to really uh, get everything we wanted from a, from a radical theory of consciousness mm -hmm. of this form. So we often get lots of listener questions about the ethical or the existential implications of uh, different views in philosophy of mind. I know this is something you get asked a lot about as well. Hedda uh, spoke to us about how it might change our perspective on uh, the meaning of life or finding value in the world. And likewise, Philip Goff, got a quote from him here, panpsychism has the potential to transform our relationship with the natural world. If panpsychism is true, the rainforest, for example, is teeming with consciousness. As conscious entities, trees have value in their own right. Chopping one down becomes an action of immediate moral significance. But And then others have radically different views. So, for example, we ask the same of Galen Strawson, who says, as far as I know, nothing changes. If there's something it's like to be an electron, that's crude talk. Uh, the reasons there are for vegetarianism all stay the same. Do you see your metaphysics as affecting your ethics in the same way as perhaps uh, Hedder or Goff might think? Yeah, I don't have a really well-developed ethical view of consciousness, but I am inclined to think consciousness is very important in ethics. I mean, a strong version of this will say consciousness is at the ground of all value in the world. Without In a world without consciousness, there would likewise be no ethical value, no well-being, no aesthetic value, no normativity. I'm at least a little bit, little bit sympathetic with that idea. And connected to that is the idea that what gives a being moral status, what puts a being in the circle of creatures who we at least need to think about morally, as whether we're sort of harming them or helping them and so on in our moral calculations. What does that is consciousness. If a being is not conscious, it has no moral status. If it is conscious, it has some moral status. So lately I've thought a bit about, for example, what I call the zombie trolley problem. Um, it's, it's a version of the old trolley problem in philosophy. Who do you kill? The one person or the five on the other, tr the five on this track or divert mm -hmm. it to one on that track? Just say, um, well, down this track, there is one conscious being but you have the cho choice to divert it to a track with five zombies who behave a lot like human beings but have no conscious experience at all. Um, mm -hmm. What should you do? And many people report the, the judgment that, yeah, they should change the trolley from the track where it would kill the conscious being and kill the five zombies instead. Why? Because the zombies are not conscious and don't have moral status. Or some people say maybe they have some moral status but drastically less than a human being because they're not conscious. So if that's right, it kind of suggests, okay, there's some very important connection between consciousness and moral status. There's a version of this many people interested in animal rights put forward, which is basically agrees with this, that says, yeah, consciousness is what gives you moral status. But there's a more specific version associated with Peter Singer and others who say what actually matters is the capacity for happiness or suffering, mm. for pain or pleasure. That's what really gives you moral status. I call it affective consciousness, consciousness with a positive or negative valence. This one I'm much more strongly inclined to reject. Mm -hmm. Here, for me, the relevant thought experiment is not a zombie, but what we can call a Vulcan, like uh, like Mr. Spock from uh, <laughs> Star Trek, a very extreme version mm -hmm. of Mr. Spock from Star Trek. It's so extreme, never experiences 
happiness or sadness, never experiences suffering, pleasure, mm. or pain. No affective state of consciousness. Every state of consciousness of this being is affectively neutral. Does that being have moral status? I don't know. My very strong intuition is it does. It would be horrific to kill one of these Vulcans. And in the Vulcan trolley problem, if you have the choice of, you know, of one being with affective consciousness or five Vulcans, no, it would be something monstrous about diverting the trolley to kill the five Vulcans. Conscious beings, even without affective consciousness, matter just about as much as beings with affective consciousness. So I'm inclined to say, um, yeah, what matters here is not the capacity for happiness or suffering, but something much more basic like the capacity for consciousness of any kind. That's what gives you moral status. Now, it may well be that different kinds of consciousness give you different kinds of moral status here. For example, maybe the capacity to think and reason consciously puts you in a different league morally from merely having conscious perception or the feeling of pain. And I think, yeah, things get very complicated around then. I don't want to say that humans and dogs and mice have exactly the same moral status just because they're all conscious. So, yeah, I think there's an awful lot to say about how different kinds of consciousness may give you different kinds of moral status. Nonetheless, I, I still am inclined to think there's some very deep link between consciousness value and morality here. We've had a bunch submitted, so thank you everybody who submitted questions through our website. To submit questions for any of our future guests, you can find forms on our website or submit them via Twitter or Facebook. Um, so we'll fly through as many as possible. So imagine that these listeners perhaps are on a trolley about to fly off into the distance and you're on the side of the track and you've got to get, give them your response as quickly as, okay. as possible, David. <laughs> Very good. So our first question comes from Emerson Green from the U.S., Hi, David. My question has to do with strong versus weak emergence. If consciousness emerged, would it have to be an instance of strong emergence? Is it even conceivable that the what it's like of experience could have been an instance of weak emergence? Thanks in advance. Yeah, so emergence is one of these words that people use in very different ways. The way philosophers often use it is emergence is something kind of magical. You put things together and you get something totally different and in principle unpredictable coming out of it. That's strong emergence. For physicists and computer scientists, they mean something much more deflationary. Just put together enough stuff in a complicated way, you get complicated patterns arising from them, which are maybe somewhat surprising, but still predictable in principle. That's weak emergence. I think weak, weak emergence is absolutely ubiquitous in the sciences and is very much amenable to a reductionist treatment. But consciousness is not like that. I think the kinds of things that lead people to say there's a hard problem of consciousness are precisely the kinds of things that suggest that it's not just going to be a weakly emergent phenomenon. So my own view is that actually in nature, there is only one clear case of something which is strongly emergent from the physical, and that's consciousness. So that's my view, at least. Our second question from Isabel Walker, also from the U.S., um, she says, could you ask David something about synesthesia? Perhaps, uh, quote, most people haven't experienced synesthesia. Could this be a different version of the merry thought experiment? Yeah, synesthesia is very interesting. It's when people get sensations associated with one kind of sensory domain from stimuli associated with another. I actually, as a matter of fact, I had synesthesia myself for much of my life until I turned around 20 when it when it disappeared, apparently it's quite common with synesthesia. The kind I had was music color synesthesia. You would listen, I would listen to say a song or certain chords, and they would seem to me to have certain colors. Often they were kind of boring colors, like a murky green or brown. But every now and then there'd be something that was like bright red or bright blue. And that was, that was, uh, that was very interesting. I'd live for those, uh, for those moments. I didn't think very Can much of Can you remember of any of these? Can you remember any of the songs? Or I anything remember from... one. There was a Here, There, and Everywhere by the Beatles, which starts with these very distinctive chord patterns. Mm. To live a better life. Anyway, <laughs> <Pretty> <laughs> and uh, these, these, these chords are very distinctive. And this was bright red. It was one of the very few songs that was, uh, that was bright red. Something about the tonality of those chords. And I have no idea what the mechanism was. I didn't think about it that much. At the time, I thought it was normal. But then I remember I read 
I was reading back in some old diaries from uh, when I was a graduate student. I said, ah, songs don't have colors anymore. What happened? <laughs> and apparently, I guess the wiring in your brain changes. Um, mm. But yeah, apparent, um, but synesthesia is fascinating. And uh, philosophers have started to uh, to write some things about it. I mean, I think you don't need synesthesia to get the hard problem. I mean, Mary in the black and white room uh, gives you a version of it even without synesthesia. But, you know, philosophers do talk a lot about inverting qualia. Couldn't you have the same kind of stimuli and different conscious experiences? And synesthesia, I guess, might be a limited case of that. The most common form, actually, is color letter synesthesia. You look at letters and you get some color experiences associated with that. I mean, you also get the visual experiences. But I think, I guess, I suppose my view is it doesn't transform the problem of consciousness, but it gives you some wonderful illustrations. Our next question comes from Nathan Stanley in the United Kingdom. And Nathan says, Just caught up and listened to the Michelle Montague episode. What does Chalmers think about the contents of our phenomenology? Does he think there is more to qualia than just the sensory ones? For example, would he agree with Montague that there is such a thing as cognitive phenomenology? Yes, very much so. I'm very much inclined to think that phenomenology, conscious experience, is not exhausted by sensory experience. You know, in this view, that you have vision and you have hearing and maybe pain and pleasure in your conscious experience, but that's it. Everything else is reducible to that sort of thing. No, I think there's definitely a conscious experience of thinking and reasoning. Uh, you know, I've, in the past, I've sometimes thought about a thought experiment of somebody who had no sensory experience at all but still was engaged in, say, mathematical thinking and reasoning. And I think, yeah, they might well be conscious. There would still be something it's like to be them. To me, that suggests there's something to the experience of thinking that goes beyond any purely sensory experience. Thank you, David. And then I'll, uh, the second, uh, the next question sorry, comes from Phil Capita in the USA, and he says, If a teleporter were invented that could perfectly deconstruct the entirety of your physical self and then perfectly reconstruct your physical self at some other location, also perfectly accurate in its coordinates, do you believe that your consciousness would also be perfectly transmitted into this new construction? If not, why not? Oh, that's a classic and it's a (laughs) tough one. I've, I've never never really quite be able to make up my mind about this. I mean, I don't think I would get into it, into the teleporter, because I'd just be too worried that, you know, it might kill me. <laughs> the question is, you know, will it, does it kill you and make a twin on the other end, or does it just send you through to the other end? I mean, in Star Trek, they mostly make it look like they just send you through just fine, but every now and then mm-hmm. something goes wrong, you know, where, like, the original Captain Kirk is there and somebody at the other end, and then we, then what do you want to say? It's like, oh, it's somebody, it's now it's somebody new at the other end, unless you destroy the original. So I don't know. I don't have a well worked out view of personal identity here, which is what you need to solve these cases. I've tried to think about it here and there. I think I slightly favor the view that I would survive this process. This would would not be all that different from what goes on in Mm. ordinary survival. But I'm not so confident of this that I would just casually step in the tele- teleporter to save, like, just say someone gave me the choice of, um, you know, driving three hours to get somewhere or teleporting them, or teleporting to get there. I think there's enough risk that I'm wrong about the teleporter and that that's going to kill me, that I think I'm going to take the three hours and drive. <laughs> Our final listener question comes from Mate Dates Pod on Twitter, who asks, to what extent does Chalmers think plant life could have potential for conscious experience? Say, for instance, a subterranean network of fungi. Love the show. Oh, great question. And yeah, I'm not sure about this case. I think part, you know, my mind is divided about views about consciousness, roughly between forms of panpsychism and forms of dualism. Insofar as I go the panpsychist way, where consciousness is present even in elementary particles and the like, mm. I guess I'd almost certainly want to extend it to plants as well, which are, after all, much more sophisticated, but also unified and show complex behaviors and so mm. on. I'd at least be inclined to think probably there in plants. When I go the dualist way, then that tends to work best when consciousness is only present above a certain threshold of complexity. And it's very much an open question 
where that might be. I mean, it's my intuition say that at least all mammals are conscious and probably fish are conscious and maybe even insects. But yeah, plants, it becomes much harder to know there. I mean, plants have sophisticated information processing. So if you have one of these views that links information processing to consciousness, there's at least a, ki- a case for extending it to plants. But I guess I'd have to be at the end agnostic about this one. So a uh, round of concluding remarks as we finish here. Uh, I'll kick us off. Uh, I just want to say thank you, David, for taking the time to speak with us today. You've been a long requested guest for a very long time. Lots of people write in and ask if we can get you on the show. And we've been trying to get you on for a while. So thank you for, for coming on coming on and speaking to us. Oh, it's, it's, it's been, been a pleasure to, to finally be here. And yeah, thanks for a great conversation. Like many people listening to your works, uh, you know, motivated and, and helped me think about consciousness for a long time. And every time I think about it, I leave it to a side again and pick it back up. And it's always your work, which I'll pick back up to kind of get me started on it again. And I think you yourself, I quote you here, it's like that nagging itch that keeps going back which mm-hmm. just won't go away and that's how i find it I, you know, i'll have a conversation like this i'll put it to a side so i can get on with my life and just accept one of these views and then i realize that i shouldn't have and that's what i love about your work and your philosophy you leave all these doors open and never quite go in and make yourself at home and i think that's the should be the it's, it's an admirable quality in a philosopher to say no we should keep all these options live here are the virtues and, and the vices of each one and you know i'm it kind of measure them in that way and i think uh, we can learn a lot from you outside of philosophy of mind um as well as in it so thank you oh thanks thanks so much it's, gl- it's nice to have a uh, a podcast run by someone who feels this uh the problem of consciousness in their bones uh the way that uh the way that i do yeah the problem is endlessly fascinating think about consciousness it leads you to think about almost everything so if there are some listeners mm. out there who um who've been led to think about consciousness in this way too well, that's fantastic Yes, I just want to thank you as well, David, for joining us today for a fascinating discussion about consciousness. And, you know, uh, you know, doing the podcast has uh, given us the privilege to interview so many different people about this topic. And a lot of those people are very, very, uh, like you said in, the, in today's episode, very entrenched in their views. Um, and it's quite interesting um, and refreshing actually talking to you today because you just seem very, very open um, to all of the different, uh, you know, uh, responses to the hard problem of consciousness. And I just think that's fantastic. And I think that that is a, you know, a way that hopefully we will make progress with this question, you know, being open to different ideas, no matter how radical or somewhat strange they may appear at first. Um, so I, I really appreciate your openness to these ideas and you giving them the time to kind of explore them in depth. I think that's a very um very good philosophy so thank you very much well thanks yeah what is it what is it they say you should be as open-minded as possible but not so open-minded that your brain falls out so (laughs) hopefully my brain hasn't fallen out yet but you never know (laughs) Uh, i want to say thank you as well david for coming on and talking to us as jack said you know very um much requested guest so it's been a real privilege to talk to you today and hopefully our listeners will really enjoy the conversation I also, in preparation for this episode, you know, went back and I was reading The Conscious Mind again, which I haven't done properly for a good few years. And just I just really enjoyed going back over the stuff and the second half with the speculations on information theory and, you know, quantum mechanics. And I just it kind of made me think, oh, there's a kind of really nice big picture um, sort of philosophy that you're you know trying to spell out. And you've you kind of had your eye on the ball of some big issues for quite a long time. And as Jack and Ollie both said, but without ever dismissing any potential answers to those big topics. So I think that was um, something that I've really enjoyed doing. And something that I'm going to go away and think about more is I'm not going to stop worrying about Vulcans and the trolley problem now. I think that, uh, <laughs> part of me thinks maybe it's okay to get rid of Vulcans. I don't know. Okay, interesting. I guess that's <laughs> monstrous, really. So I just thought, yeah, <laughs> Vulcans, a conscious Vulcan is in your way of getting to your destination one hour sooner. Then you'll just knock off the Vulcan because they're just uh, they're just meat. <laughs> Interesting. I'll remind any, anybody out there who is, is lacking affective consciousness, stay away from this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you may be in danger. Hosted by monsters. Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy quiz. So we're playing David Chandler's. So you're going to get quotes from a David... <laughs> 
uh, a Chandler's and David Chalmers. So your David is going to be David Eric Grohl, the American singer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist and film director, best known as the longest serving drummer of the rock band Nirvana and mm-hmm. the founder of the band Foo Fighters. Mm-hmm. You've got a Chandler, which is Chandler Bing, the fictional character mm. in the hit show Friends, played by the brilliant Matthew Perry. And you've got quotes from David Chalmers, the University Press of Philosophy and Neuroscience and co-director of the Centre of Mind, Brain and Consciousness. Am, am, I, am I playing or am I, am I ruled out from this one? You're playing along. Okay. And as of, as of late, if you don't mind me saying, okay. Ollie and Greg, you've been, abys- you, you've been abysmal in the last two. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so the, uh, the, I, I thought a bit of negative motivation there might, might help you along. It's okay, times like these you learn to live again. It's times like these you give and give again. <laughs> it's times like these you learn to love again. It's times like these time and time again. It's got to be Dave Grohl. It's, it's, it's Dave it's Grohl. I think Greg and Ollie being polite there rather than jumping in for a point. I'm just another soul for sale. <laughs> Chandler? It's not Chandler. No, is that uh, Dave Grohl? That means Dave Grohl again, that's, right? That's Dave Grohl, but Ollie pipped you to that one. Okay. Maybe not everyone loves Glee, me included. I watched 10 minutes and it wasn't my thing. David Grohl? It's David Grohl. It's 1-1-1 yeah, one, one, one across so the board. Dave Grohl's. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what must it be like not to be crippled by fear and self-loathing? Chandler David Bing. Oh. It's Chandler Bing. It's 2-1-1. One, one. <laughs> you have to stop the Q-tip when there is resistance. Chandler, Chandler Bing. Bing. It's Chandler Bing, but Greg pictured there. Abolish the monarchy. Uh, that's me. <laughs> that's <David> <laughs> I got the zombie blues. That's me too. Chandler's storming ahead here at four, two, one. Bangers and beans. I swear to God, on my life, this is my favourite meal in the world. I could eat it seven times a day for the rest of my life. I'm not joking. Everything else is. Sh- Dave. <laughs> it's not Dave Grohl. It. Oh, it's Dave Grohl. Well, oh, well, okay. we'll play. Do I lose one? At the moment, it's 4-2-2. Two, two. We'll play a couple <laughs> more to see if we can get an equaliser. My consciousness is playing no role in me talking about consciousness. This seems bizarre. Chandler Bing. <laughs> <laughs> David Chalmers? Chandler Bing. <laughs> it's David Chalmers, Ollie. Ollie, you've got a chance to, to end this in a draw here. Um, we swallow our feelings even if it means we're unhappy forever. Chandler? It's Chandler, well David done. Grohl. It's four, four, oh. <laughs> World War Two. Oh, that was a tough one. Yeah. Okay, the very last one. We might have a winner. What if I say I'm not like the others? What if I say I'm not just another <laughs> one of your plays? You're the pretender. What if I say I'll never surrender? Dave Grohl. It's Dave Grohl. Well done, David. You've... You've won the day there. A very special thank you to Cullum St. Gabriel's and West Hill Endowment for keeping our Cartesian theatre on the road, as well as all of our metaphysical snakes that make up our patrons. From the bottom of the ghosts in our machines, we want to say a very special thank you to our most esteemed patrons, David Ligeness, Lily Hooper, Mr. T, Jimmy Casperson, Miran van der Kolk, Adam Cole and Jim Clare. Thank you all for your phenomenal support. Thank you also to those donating directly through our website, most recently... Alan, Roberts, and Rob. As you know, producing the Pan Psychast requires a lot of time and resources, and we're incredibly grateful to everybody who shows their support. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider clicking one of the links in the iTunes description. If you're not enjoying the podcast, but you're here just to hear from David, links to his plethora of books, papers, and lectures, and all of his interviews can be found on our website, or you can cut out the middleman and hit the link in the iTunes description, which will take you straight to his website. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, soothing voices of Mr. Ollie Marley. Thank you for listening. Dr. Gregory Miller. Thank you for listening. Professor David Chalmers. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. And me, Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. Very good. I said, do you always take it easy on your guests in this little game at the end? <laughs> <laughs> it may appear that we were taking it easy. I was having some yeah, serious... Okay. Uh, serious-